the Storytelling Festival is in town in Oklahoma City. Runs Thursday through Saturday. Started last night. We're taping this interview on Friday morning. It runs through Saturday at the Oklahoma History Center. Two of the three featured tellers join us today here in the Oklahoma's Video Studio. Charlotte Blake Alston and Jim May. Guys, thanks for stopping by this morning. Great to meet you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. We, we mentioned that it started last night. How'd it go? It went wonderfully. It was uh, very well attended. I don't, there were, I don't know if I saw any empty seats uh, in the house. A very receptive audience in a wonderful space, by the way. Yeah. The whole history center is beautiful. Yeah, isn't yeah it? We, you know, our stage was right under, under the airplane yeah. that's suspended. And one of our storytellers grew up, uh, uh, she, she calls her neighborhood, you know, at the end of the runway at, at O'Hare. <laughs> so the first thing she did is gotten with Megan, Megan Wells Megan said, Wells. I feel right at home here. You know, the airplane sure. is going on. And she is the third of the three storytellers. Yes. Yeah. Now, I noticed Thursday, Friday, Friday, Saturday, uh, perhaps each one of you closes the show on a different night, right? Correct. Yes, uh, you'll see each of the tellers at uh, every concert, uh, but two of us will do a short set, and then the second half of the program, one person gets to really delve into some story for about 45, 50 minutes. And you guys are also doing workshops while you're here. What, mm -hmm. What's going on in the workshops? Well, my workshop is called uh, Personal Narrative, Culture, and Myth. So it's really taking our, our own ex experience, our family stories. That's kind of starts there. Uh, what was it like in your family? Where's the first house you remember living in? Uh, who were who the strange relatives? <laughs> who were the interesting, <laughs> you know? Uh, because you uh, could perhaps dig stories from yeah, each absolutely. of those experiences. You know, it's all in there. So we, we, we kind of like pull the files out, you know. And then, you know, uh, so personal, uh, cu personal culture, family, and myth, or um, those all go together. We have our family, we have the culture that we're, we're raising. Then we have these myths, these great stories from uh, uh, spiritual traditions and mythology, you know, over the millennia that have, have affected us too, you know. Or you, you take a very, um, you know, the myth of uh, anybody can be president. Well, that, that's a myth in almost every sense of the word. The colloquial version of myth is, nah, that can't happen. That's just a myth. To, in some ways, that has guided our country. Like, we all have opportunity. We all can do it if we work hard enough. And the myths, on the one hand, can be referred to as old wives' tales. But on the other hand, they're the, the truth that we live by, you know, the myths that we live by. So putting all those together, your personal experience, the culture you grew up in, these old big stories you learned in church and school and that has sunk in, and how do those all... Uh, how did all that um, amalgam of stories influence our daily lives and relationships? And Charlie, your works. So on? mine is uh, rhythm this and melody that. I incorporate a lot of rhythmic elements and music uh, into my storytelling. So it's mainly geared for storytellers um, who are interested in incorporating rhythmic elements uh, and musical elements into their storytelling. I think there's one there's one workshop that is unique here uh, at this particular festival. A lot of festivals around the country, the national one, and that's the Finding Your Voice workshop, where each feature teller each year is asked to tell the same story. And then we speak the story and we talk about the process. So it takes us a while to select a story. We've selected a story and then we have no idea how the other teller is going to tell that story. So that happens on Saturday yeah. afternoon. Well, that's pretty cool. And how different could it possibly be? <laughs> well, this year the, the, we, we picked uh, the story of Apollo and Phaeton. <clears throat> Phaeton is the son of Apollo and is, he wants to be recognized. The kids don't believe that his dad's a god, you know. <clears throat> so he goes to Apollo, and Apollo says, anything you want. And he said, I want to drive the fiery chariot across the it sky. The According to the Greek the myth, Apollo is the one who drives the sun across the sky. And dad says, well, you know, I, I shouldn't let you. Anything I shouldn't have that. said anything. But he gave his, his oath on, on his, he's a god. He gave his oath. Uh, Solomon, so Phaeton has to do it. And it's like, you know, it's like the kid in, in the Ferrari, you know, like he never should have been there. And, you know, suddenly it's Ferris Bueller's yeah. day off. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't end well. Doesn't end well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a metaphor, of course, for human experience, right? right. Just like my workshops. That's a metaphor for we've all been in there, we've all had those things we, we didn't have the, you know, quite the background to get into. And maybe it ended well, and maybe it didn't. But uh, so. and then there's a lot of issues too around relationships between fathers and sons. So, um, like I said, we we don't know how the other person is going to do it. But it, it generally we each incorporate whatever we're going to do into our storytelling style, um, and uh, it should be a, a great adventure for all of us. So you know, I'm approaching it in a way that I haven't done in the past, so it'll be a little bit of an experiment for me. Well, that's cool, yeah. and that's got to be kind of fun. Yeah. So we mentioned the Storytelling Festival runs through Saturday at the Oklahoma History Center. The History Center does have the gigantic, iconic uh, Winnie Mae 
hanging above up there. And you mentioned O'Hare. I was in Chicago last weekend. Went to Second City, mm. which is their iconic a story. Story yeah. comedy, uh, <coughs> comedy, uh, comedy. Oh, place. right, Mecca. Right. Yeah, comedy. and so like there's six guys and girls, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you will, on stage doing their skits, but then the ad lib. And it was interesting to see the different styles and you know, they would ask the crowd for a word and then they ad lib off of that. What are you guys' styles and how did you get started in this? Wow, um, I, I guess overall, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the longest story that I think we have time for in the interview, but I, I That's guess- That's what we're here to do, the, <laughs> tell stories this weekend. The, the seeds were planted when I was young and my dad just had a passion for language. I grew up in a musical family. My mother was a church organist. Everyone had to take piano lessons. My dad couldn't carry a tune from the living room to the dining room, but, but um, he had a passion for language. I was a daddy's girl. I followed him around, including when the door was closed in the bedroom and he was trying to write. Yeah. And I would just go sit there just to be around him. And he began reading out loud what he was writing or what he was reading. And he gave me a book of poems uh, and selected a poem for me to read around six years old, and I memorized it. And a light bulb went on and he started writing these comedy monologues for me. He saw that I had a good memory and so I started standing in front of people as a kid. Were you always the funniest kid in the class? I was the quietest kid really? in the class. <laughs> the quietest you just one. So people would be it, shocked if, when I would stand up and had great confidence because he would coach me. Gotcha. So, but the storytelling came, we both uh, are, are educators, okay. uh, former educators, when I was just using storytelling as a myriad number of things I, you hope teachers are doing to bring history alive and literature alive and engage children. That has to be a great that's skill where it started. as a teacher to be able to speak effectively and to, to relate through stories. Absolutely, especially when you have children in front of you who all internalize and process information in different ways. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Jim, well, how did you on, get on that point, uh, uh, I came from a family, a big farm family in a small farming community. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I used to follow my dad around. And I always said the first stories I heard were, were horse trading stories, you know, stories about trading a, a blind horse for a dry cow and who got the better of the deal, you know, that kind of thing. So it kind of, it kind of came organically. In fact, I want to do a couple of riffs off of Will Rogers. He's one of my heroes this weekend. But, um, and then someone kind of dragged me kicking and screaming down to something called the National Storytelling Festival. In Tennessee, it's like uh, Nashville is the country music center of the of the of the country. Uh, Jonesboro, on the other side of the state, in the mountains, is the oral history sport storytelling center of the country. And I heard all these mountain people telling stories. Jackie Torrance. I learned one story about this this character called Jack, who's a cousin of Jack and the Beanstalk, but he's the Scots Irish Appalachian cousin. <laughs> his adventures, <laughs> his adventures all involve bib overalls and cat head biscuits, you know. And, 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 well, and well, of course, right? But, 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 of, but, but of course, giants and unicorns, too. Yeah. But anyway, I learned this one story. I told him. I see the unicorn coming. I, I, okay. It's in there. It's in there, honest to gosh. Right in the holler, unicorn. Right in the holler. Having biscuits and gravy for breakfast. It's Anyways, so I, 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 I learned that one story at that at storytelling festival in Tennessee. I came back and I told my fifth graders, and they looked at each other like, this guy is a lot more interesting <laughs> than he was last Friday afternoon. You know, what happened to him? And, and actually, in 10 years of teaching, I had never seen my children so focused. So engaged. So that's when something... They reacted to that. Oh, yeah. Like I hadn't seen in 10 years of teaching. I, I was blown over as a teacher, and I thought I'd seen everything yeah. after 10 years of fifth graders. So I got, I, they wanted more stories. I only knew one story. And mine was similar. I did a, a, a story in a, an assembly program at the elementary school where I was teaching. And kids and colleagues got excited and started talking about, you know, when are you going to do that again? And I wondered what the magic was. And I went to hear a storyteller. And just with his voice, he just transported us out of the space we were in into the Western Plains. And so I understood its power. And so I began to research stories that came out of my own tradition, out of Western African or African American tradition. So that generally are, are the kinds of stories that I tell. We were talking about that subject you just sort of touched on there, that storytelling, the audience creates the images in their minds. Mm -hmm. They're perhaps a little bit more engaged in what's going on than just the mindless entertainment of sitting in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Absolutely, right. yeah. Because as Charlotte said, in, in, the sc in screens, and this is part of your business, the image is already created, you know, before you. So the certain part of the mind doesn't have to do that investigative reporting, I guess you could call it. Um, uh, whereas in storytelling, you have language. And so it's a direct uh, connection between language and the inner imaginative uh, uh, mechanism that we all have. Now, Einstein said imagination was more important than knowledge. You know, so that's, that's where we live. 
Well, you start throwing out words like unicorns and <coughs> cat and biscuits, your mind instantly starts to create mm -hmm. those images and thoughts mm -hmm. and then probably whatever's oh, associated with that. Oh, and sensations and tastes and smells right. and all of that. Yeah. Exactly, or it yeah. takes you back to your mom making biscuits in the yeah. kitchen or whatever. And, and we it, often have, I'm sure Jim has the same experience, where you tell a story and, and you know you get off the stage and everything's over and people come up to you and say, that story you told reminded me of. Sure. Uh, and then you start to get their story and the connection that they've made to the one you've told. You know, and on a kind of a global sense, you were talking about, well, that will that work? Well, te the teaching, basing your curriculum on, on, on child-centered imagination, will that work? Well, there was a time in educational circles, and we do a lot of work in schools and universities, when there was a lot of talk of, of uh, you know, Japan who was making at that time the best cars, the best cameras, the best uh, Sony Walkmans, you know, what happened to those? Uh, <laughs> they, but they would still come over here because um, they were making the best of, but they weren't inventing the process. Yeah. You know, it was Gates and, and, and uh, Steve Jobs, and we were making the big, you know, what's the next idea. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so, so, you know, Steve Jobs talks about visiting the Xerox company and seeing that they had all their copy machine stuff on these little icons. You, know, you hit this icon for a copy, you hit this icon for a fax, and, and uh, uh, he looked around and he said, he thought to himself, his, these copy heads don't know what they got, but this is how every computer in the world is going to work someday. And he bought that, that process from Xerox for, for pennies, uh, virtually, you know, relatively speaking. Right. So, so, you know, imagination, the people who have a, the imaginative ideas are, are going to change the world. I uh, interviewed a couple of storytellers last year. Bill Lepp, he was a mm -hmm. uh, Bill Lepp, he was yep. a uh, champion. He's a liar, liar, <laughs> if you will. He's a liar. But Bill's I, a liar. But I asked those two uh, when they go home for Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, <laughs> what's the family conversation like? Are you guys dominating oh, play, or is the whole family interacting with? No, great I can stories? stand in front of thousands of people, and they stand and applaud. And I go home and uh, I get no privileges whatsoever. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, we're kind of competing for uh, well, like who gets to tell the story. And yeah, uh, yeah, you, you know, know, you got you know, where the roles go and kind of thing. But a lot of what happens is, well, it's, it's um, uh, memories of past experiences of the family gathering together. Right. And uh, I think what I, I always enjoyed was sharing stories of relatives, sharing stories to our kids who are grown now of relatives that they didn't get to meet. Um, and sometimes I just do it like in their voice, like that Aunt Maggie. Yeah, she just, and she, she, she laughed loud. Everything, was, everything she said was loud, and her, her laugh used to run down. <laughs> so just telling those kinds of stories and recalling that. that. And, <laughs> and, then, and then each person's memory of it, because everyone's sure. memory of those things is different. That's, so, what, family, that's what family should be. <laughs> yeah, right? and, and, and some of the stories are the stories you've heard like 40, 50, 60 years. Right, right. Here we go again. Yeah, yeah. but they're about. fresh every time. Well, if I want to get my teenage granddaughter's head out, of, eyes, head, head out of their cell phone, which is not easy, you know, <laughs> uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, Katrina, when you were uh, five, uh, or when you were two, I guess, uh, you said your favorite thing was like to take uh, the, the, the spoon off the tray, look us right in the eye, and drop it, and go, <laughs> Uh oh, you know, 40 or 50 times before breakfast. Yeah, the first and time it's funny. You start, the 39th time. You start telling them, tell, you start telling them their stories about their life. Yeah. And and, uh, but in general, you know, we start t t telling a story at the dinner table, and the kids all reach for the cell phones like everybody else. You know, we, you know, our family gets kind of tired of our stories. <laughs> but uh, you know, some of the Broadway guys, and I'll, I'll end on this. Uh, they're saying and that's disruptive. Do, do you guys see that during your? Festivals. What are people on their phones? The, you know, the blue screens illuminating Sometimes, their faces. Sometimes, once once in a while, um, uh, I think what's more distracting to me is the light that tells me someone is videotaping uh, the performance, and hmm. which I find uh, a bit annoying and distracting. And 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 yeah, and then you have to make the choice about uh, how to respond to that or not respond uh, to that. But it's not. You know, I don't find it to I be I think our audience comes problem. with a little different intention. They, they come to listen. The purpose yeah. of, you know, well, that's, you come to watch and right, listen to theater right. as well. But these are pretty engaged ex listening experiences, um, storytelling is, I think. So people are drawn into the, the story, and that's where they are for that moment in time. So I think when the phone rings, it's, it's often by accident, and it jolts that person out of it. Yeah, and we ask, the, you know, usually the, the master of ceremonies, the MC will ask people to turn off their, yeah. their devices and, and, um, 
And so I think, I think that often, especially in the early days of, of doing this work, and, and now still as well, people come because the first time they heard a storyteller or the first time they came to an event, they were taken back to a grandparent or a mom or dad or someone who sat you know, on the porch at night you know, and told stories. And they're taken back to that, and they want to recreate that experience again. So they know that the, the devices, the cell phones, will interfere with that. So a lot of people already pre-select. They, they go ahead and they, they come with that intention, I think. A little bit more respectful. Yeah. Go see these guys, Charlotte and Jim, the Oklahoma Storytelling Festival. The Storytelling Festival, sponsored by the Arts Council. More information at artscouncilokc.com. Guys, great to meet you. Thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate the conversation. Pleasure. Thank you so much. And best of luck this weekend. Thank Thanks. you.